Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. African penguins are a sad example of how humans are devastating them. It's just a single species. What can they teach us? I mean, the answer is I don't think scientists know uh, what uh, triggers that behavior, right? That 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 motivation to all suddenly go from like normal. How they Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. And that's a wrap. That's all we need. <laughs> I didn't think we were doing donkeys today. I didn't know we were doing donkeys. I prepared for the wrong species. You know I always slide in a hoofstock animal when I can, right? <laughs> Don't tell me that is the African penguin. That is the African penguin. That is not only the African penguin, but that is the African penguin braying. That is insane. That is so amazing. I I literally I read some stuff like they call him the jackass penguin and whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, the 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 donkey penguin and I was like, "Okay, whatever." I just that's the first time I heard that. That is hilarious. Yes, they make a lot of other sounds as well, but that vocalization, that bray, is they're definitely famous for, for sure. But <laughs> stick with us and you'll learn why. Why it's so mm-hmm. cool and so important for them to have. Maybe to you it's an obnoxious sound, but to its mate and a busy colony, it's mm-hmm. music to their ears. And it oh, helps yeah. them identify oh, yeah. one another. Uh, so just, oh, Chris, I'm in love with penguins this week. They uh, in love. So okay, so we're going back to Africa. So now it has been back to back to back to Southern Africa for Angie. You know, in celebration yes. of Angie coming back. Yes. yes. And, and I mean, and we're covering the species really because you know, we, huge announcement this week. We have Stephanie Arnie on for an interview. My soul sister, love her. Oh, She's phenomenal. She, I she's a I, mover and a shaker. Uh, yes. She gets things done. She's an inspiration. Very, the interview is very. phenomenal. I just want to be your best friend, and she inspires me to be a better conservationist and a better human being in general. So, an educator. She's an amazing well. human being. Yeah, that's oh, why I wrote down. She's an amazing. She's an amazing human being. It another was Midwe- another Midwestern girl. So I think yeah, there's yeah. some secret in the sauce there in the good old Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you know, I mean, what an amazing few weeks for us. We had, you know, Rick Schwartz on last week. Him and Stephanie are very good friends. We had Stephanie on this week. And the reason we're covering African penguins is because she's got a major project that we're going to talk a little bit about later in the podcast of helping them because the African penguin you know, they're yes, endangered. And I they're had endangered. no idea. I had mm-hmm, no idea, mm-hmm. Chris. Yeah. And they're they're in big, big, big trouble. And so Stephanie has a project that she's actually been working on. She went to South Africa, visited them, where they are, where they're nesting, and we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. So that's why we agreed. Yeah, we're we're gonna revisit penguins. This is quite different than the Emperor Penguin, right? Oh, Very extremely different. different. I mean just a, yeah, it's very, very. It's gonna be a fun podcast. I I learned a lot doing it. Of course, watched amazing videos, listened to a lot of videos, mm-hmm. and fell in love again once again with the penguin. And these guys are very charming. And I'm just gonna warn you. I've I'm gonna get on my high horse today. I've got some data that I really want to share with the listeners and give more insight into you know why this species is in so much trouble, and then also why worldwide. A lot of species are in so much trouble. And I I think going into year three, Angie and I have kind of started doing this where we're kind of injecting a little bit more of the conservation while we cover the animal physiology and the basic stuff. So we hope this kind of opens your eyes into kind of what's going on around the world. And again, I just want to highlight Disney nature penguins. I know in Emperor Penguins, I brought it up because I just seen the movie. It's I think it's believe it's out on DVD now, or you can you can get it on I don't know if Netflix has it, but somewhere you can watch it. If you haven't seen it, it's amazing. I mean, Disney is <laughs> happiest place on earth and Disney nature, the stuff they're doing. So I would just recommend you learn a lot about the Adelie penguin. It's just amazing to to learn about the different species because, 
you know, let's be honest. We chose an emperor penguin first because they're the most charismatic, the most that people know about. But a lot of these other penguin species people don't know about, especially the African penguin. Right. Yes. And, and it's just, I mean, it's pretty incredible because we always think of penguins and we think of the Antarctic and the African penguin, like its name says, does not live in Antarctica. And it is the only species of penguin that's found in Southwestern Africa. And Mm -hmm. it's just really cool. And I uh, didn't get to see any African penguins when I was in South Africa. But hopefully the next time I go to Africa, they'll definitely be on the bucket list because no, they're not, they're not in the big five, but Mm-mm. by the end of this episode, they should be in your top five. I think right. Forget about leopards. Right. You can't see them. Trust me. I've tried three times. <laughs> Watch the first time I go, the first time I go to Kruger, I'm going to see a leopard. I'll probably see like three. Oh, uh, it was like my friends, my friends, uh, uh, Laura and Jason, they, uh, yeah. they were literally leaving the airport and, uh, and Kruger and saw, a leopard. So within the first <laughs> good for them. Minutes, good yeah. for them. Mm-hmm. Good for them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, real quick, I just want to say welcome Brittany from Missouri who joined us on Patreon and also Asa. So thank you so much. You know, it, just real quick, one cappuccino a month supports us in wildlife. We're going to release a species for our Patreon listeners next week. It's a, it's a big one. We're excited. It, it's that's yeah, when I used not to work huge with. physically. Yeah, not huge physically, what? but it's, it's pretty, a big they're one. They're not small. I used that's, to catch true. Them up. that's true. They're okay. not okay. Okay. small. We will have that discussion for our Patreon folks. You know, we still have meerkats on there, sperm whales, and some other stuff on there. But thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, we just from the bottom of our hearts. And even if you don't have uh, money for a cappuccino or money for Patreon uh, this month because of the holiday season. Or just in general, you can easily tell a friend or a family member about us. Mm-hmm. Everyone loves penguins. If yes. they don't love penguins, then you might not want to be their friend. So think about that, right? <laughs> so you can <laughs> yeah, easily yeah, yeah. share this episode. And then another really easy thing, a free, cheap, wonderful thing you can do to help support this podcast and then also support the conservation groups that we uh, support here is to rate and review us on iTunes or our other rating systems. Uh, and so I want to give a quick shout out to Mia Roney. She recently reviewed us and gave us a great review. She says she loves us and it's changed her life. It's helped uh, reignite yeah. some of her passion uh, that she's had for animals since she's been a child and has her interested again in conservation education. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's an, that makes me want to get up in the morning and plan for this it podcast does. and give you guys the newest, the greatest, and the good and the bad news about animal conservation. So that really helps us out, helps us make us, yeah. you know, makes us motivates uh, us. know we're on the motivates right track. Motivates us. Yeah. Yeah. It totally motivates us and keeps us going. So thank it makes you. me think of. Thank you for those that have done that. And uh, we'll do it this week. Yeah. And I mean, you know, Pip it changed her life. You know, she went back to grad school from England. I had an email from Matt. I, Matt, I'm going to get to you. I promise. Uh, about some direction for grad school. So it's just, it, it's amazing that the community is coming together. And Stephanie talks about that, especially women in conservation. So Stephanie's interview is beyond. I mean, Rick was amazing. Stephanie's right there. It's a little long, but I'll tell you what, you put it on, you won't even realize the time flew by. We we spoke for like literally two hours and I had to cut it down <laughs> because we just, we just were in, in awe of her and her passion and her message and her experiences. Well, she's done so much. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the thing is she is always, she's got like five different projects going on at once. Yeah. Talk about yeah. a mover and shaker. I mean, right. it's just really, yeah. really in, inspirational. Yeah. And I mean, she's a, you know, she was the host for Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom you know, it's just between her and Corbin Maxey and Rick Schwartz, and we've got some more on the way. It's the community is is amazing and loving and very supportive of each other. So definitely check that out. Now, laying this out, Angie, I had to talk about this. I uh, this story is so horrific, but there is hope, and Angie's going to provide some of that hope. But you know, I would just say. Oh, I, has- I'm the I'm the bright light today. <laughs> yes, you're, please. I'm like <laughs> always, I'm always to use my Star Wars analogy. Uh, you're, you're the dark, and I'm the light. Uh, I know, That's I know. Fair. I don't mean I don't mean to. It's just looking at this and doing our research and reading up on this species, and even talking to Stephanie. African penguins 
are a sad example of how humans are devastating them. It's just a single species. And now you extrapolate that around the planet so we can look at this particular animal and see what's going on. And that is just an example of what's going on on, on every continent, you know, throughout the earth. It's going on in Antarctica. It's going on, you know, Arctic's not a continent, but the Arctic's going away. It, you know, North America, South America, you name it, Australia, with the horrific fires going on right now. So what's, you know, I kind of wanted to boil some of this down. And the, the term that scientists are now using for this era is the Anthropocene. And this is the latest geological time period on Earth. And it's basically human influenced, you know, there's overwhelming evidence that we are affecting the atmosphere, our geology, hydrology, the biosphere, all the other earth systems are being impacted by, by humans and altered and changed. It, it's scientific. We never say facts. There's a ton of evidence that says, Hey, this is happening. Right. And anthropo means human. And then scene is obviously the epic and geological time. So what was the one before this? The Holocene. So we're coming out of the Holocene. Okay. So that was the end of mammoths 10,000 years ago. And now we're in the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. And today, mm -hmm. people listening to this podcast today, we have changed the planet so much in the last 100 years. It, it's not even, it, it's unfathomable. It's unfathomable how the earth has changed so much and how the industrial age has completely changed the earth. And there's a good website I'm going to put up, put up that kind of talks through this. And I found it very fascinating. I got a beautiful graphic in front of me showing how we're impacting the earth. So climate change is, you know, right now they have it above the zone of uncertainty. So heading towards the zone of high risk, you know, climate change. We've had this to talk before. I think even the emperor penguins, I talked about climate change. It's happening don't believe the naysayers. The scientific evidence is it's happening. Okay. So it's, it's, it's becoming a, a major concern. Land system changes through, you know, habitat degradation is reaching the zone of high risk. Huge, huge problem. Okay. Some of the things, the ozone depletion is they think it's safe right now. Uh, aerosols in the atmosphere. They don't know. Ocean acidification is becoming a big problem. It's edging out yeah, of the safe operating one. space. Yeah. And we're going to do corals this year. We will do corals uh, heading towards the zone of uncertainty, you know, as the oceans warm up and the freshwater use is, is okay right now. The two that are really alarming is biochemical, bio geochemical flows, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute, phosphorus mm -hmm. and nitrogen being dumped into freshwater. And then obviously the oceans and biosphere integrity, or biodiversity is is huge. It's in the zone of high risk. This is where we find ourselves today. Okay, so this is what our podcast is all about: the loss of biodiversity. And if you go back to the Center for Biological Diversity, the attorney Brett Hartle that I had on a few weeks ago, talking which about which is one of our number one top downloaded episodes. Yeah, it's record. a big one. Let He's amazing. Let the record reflect. Yeah. Yes, if you have not checked that out, I highly, yeah. highly, highly recommend it. Yeah. It's just. Um, just a really interesting perspective. And for a lot of us, behavior and physiology, mm -hmm. animal dorks, uh, it's nice to kind of get outside the box and learn about different ways to look at things and what, from a legal perspective, what's happening out there. Yeah. Yeah. If from a lawyer perspective and then what they're doing yeah. and we're, we're going to have mm -hmm. more of them on the podcast. We definitely are. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, I mean, cause that's the other thing is policy is what, ends up needing to happen. And I think that's where we're lacking because there's mm -hmm. not enough scientists or animal lovers or whatever you want to call it that are pushing for change. We don't have the loudest megaphones. We're not screaming the loudest. We're not pushing the hardest. And mm -hmm. obviously at the Center for Biological Diversity, they are. And so yeah. it's a great, yeah. great organization to follow on Facebook or Twitter. And of course, this interview is fantastic. It uh, gives they you are. a good, good uh, to be a fly on the wall of what they're doing. And then it just gives you a lot of hope that there's people out there fighting day in, day out in the trenches. Oh, well, that's what this whole yeah. journey for me, and I, I know you as well, mm -hmm. has been, is there is a lot, you know, to use the Star Wars analogy, as we prep for the next movie coming out, which I won't watch, but my husband's going to go <laughs> yeah, to on yeah, December 20th. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. We're, traveling, we're traveling for the holidays, and he's like, I don't care if we're 
at our house or at your mom's house, but we need to be somewhere that night so I can go see it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, he's so cute. He, he asked for so little. That, yes. Yes, honey. You can be at that movie. <laughs> I think night, I saw that. For sure. I saw the last one with him. Yeah, no, I went with him last time. I took him. I know I you're such yeah. a good friend. I'm, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not that good. Well, I'll be watching the kids, so that's like okay. A okay. Helpful thing. All right. Yeah. So you go to their website, and 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 if you go back to episode one where it's me talking into a can, it sounds like me talking into a can. I kind of talked about this, <laughs> the the Earth six mass extinction, and that's what we're in right now. We haven't really addressed it in a while. But, you know, the, the background extinction rate is about one to two species per year is, is normal. It's normal for species to go extinct, just not at the rate they are now. The rate they're, they're, they're going right now is a thousand times the background rate. And we're losing, they're estimating we're losing about a dozen species a day. And that's plant life, everything of life on earth, about 12 species a day go extinct that we don't even know about. You know, you're talking about insects, frogs plants, whatever. And so the future model is 10 times higher than that. And it's just, it, we're, it's accelerating. And that's why this is such a, such major concern. So again, African penguins, why the story today is important and important to share with people. So they understand what's going on really quick biochemical flows. Cause that is way off the charts. That is flows of nitrogen and phosphorus from agriculture. Well, it was biogeochemical. I think it's important to get the geo in there too. Yeah. 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 Biogeochemical. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's why you're you're my partner on here. So. Well, I had it. Well, <laughs> it, it's it rings very true because I had as part of my major many moons mm -hmm. ago at Michigan State because I was also a zoology slash environmental biology major because I knew so many years ago back in the late 1990s that the environment was already <laughs> in trouble and the animals are. <laughs> Yeah, I wish, but thank you. That's why you're my friend. Uh, but I knew the environment was in trouble and I knew I needed to eat as much as I just want to learn about animals because that's my my true calling. Mm -hmm. I went ahead and took a lot of environmental classes from soils to uh, plants, even though you couldn't tell that on a podcast because my plant biology is just not where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. But I took an environmental uh, geochemistry class and it was all about the chemistry of rocks and it was hard. And inter interesting kind of uh, at that time for me, but still a little bit over my head for them. Later on, later on, when we talk a little bit more about this, I'm going to talk about the human impact because, you know, when we talk about how these penguins are being so affected. So to get to the, the biogeochemical, what they're really concerned is, is the nitrogen and phosphorus. It's industrial. It's agriculture being dumped into fresh water, makes its way to the sea. And it's changing aquatic you know, systems around the world. And then it adds to things like red tides, which are devastating to wildlife. Mm -hmm. Florida, you guys are plagued with that green algae blooms that, that pops up. Oh, yeah. And, oh, and yeah. It not only, not only devastates wildlife, but it's devastating tourism. You know, who wants to go to Port St. Lucie when there's this green algae bloom where you can't go in the water and it stinks and it's toxic? Yeah, no, I've, I've listened to a lot of interviews from shop owners and restaurant owners up and down the coast that are none too pleased, right? They, I mean, right. as a community, we can all get on team conservation. Like, it's pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not oh. just, of yeah. course, we're in it more for like the animals and the environment, but when it's not about the money, it's about the money. So people that are losing money from the trickle down effect of this right. want to see change too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it affects a lot of people and you know, it, it, perfect timing Angie, because it leads me into what, what I want to say next is, you know, we're in this era, everybody who listens to this podcast, we're, we're in it, you know, we're all part of it and we have major, major decisions to make and we can either sit by and let it happen, lose thousands upon thousands of species of life, or we can sit, stand up and say enough's enough. And so if you're listening to this podcast, like we, we say, we've said it before, you're a conservation hero. You're part of the solution. You're listening to this to be educated and share the knowledge. And that is how we're going to make a difference. So Angie and I, are, you know, I wrote this down. We're going to be environmental life coaches. We're going to do the best we can to empower like you with knowledge because knowledge is power. And we share it. We share it in a non-judgmental way. I mean, I go to my parents and they still have plastic bottles everywhere. I still make bad decisions every now and then. I have red meat tonight. I know. Once a month. We do it. Uh, I, it's like, I, make, I feel guilty. 
But I know it wasn't a big piece, uh, yeah. and and we are conscious about it. But yeah, so nobody's perfect. Yeah, uh, Sandy from LA Zoo. I was in a meeting with them last night, and she I could listen to her talk all night too. Just so passionate about environmentalism, the things that are going on in California, around the world. So there are many people out there. There's hope. You know, Stephanie Arney's one. She's going to give you a lot of hope this week. You know, so we can do this. We just have to do it together. And you're part of the solution. So thank you for listening. Listen to this story about the African penguin. It should get you motivated, like it motivated Stephanie and others uh, to help them because these things are stinking cute. They're super I was going to say, do I finally get to bring in the good yes, news and describe yes, them? Yes, that's where I'm at. Yes. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows what a penguin looks like, but the African penguin is a little special and different, in my opinion, because, of course, they have the traditional black top side and white belly for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, but they also have a very recognizable thick band of black that's in the shape of an upside down horseshoe that kind of mm -hmm. goes over their chest where like their clavicle is. And then even more darling, in my opinion, they also have dot like markings in the white of their belly that's flecked into their white chest feathers. And scientists believe that these little polka dots or black flecks, if you will, help to identify individual penguins. Yeah, so it's yeah. kind of like their fingerprint. So they all have different dots. And they also have these just adorable black and pink molted feet, uh, mm -hmm. which is pretty cute. But also what really makes them stand out, in my opinion, which is definitely different than the emperor is African penguin has a distinctive pink patch of skin mm -hmm. above their eyes, kind of like embedded in their black face mask. And it gives a, it's a really, it's a really important physiological tool uh, uh, to help prevent them from overheating that we'll talk about a little bit when we get to some of their gnarly uh, physical adaptations. So they're just, and they're small. So right. I'm not yeah. that we would ever want to just like pick up and hug a penguin, <laughs> but <laughs> if you were going to, this is about, this is the size and <laughs> the shape that you don't. would want. They're very don't shy, but yeah. So they stand yeah. about 24 to 27 inches tall. The males are a little bit bigger. That's up to six, 69, 70 centimeters. They weigh up to 11 pounds or up to five kilograms. So not very big, you know, where the emperor penguins are, are, you know, nearly almost four feet tall. So, but they're just they're stinking cute, stinking cute. And Angie, you said they range. You were kind of near them, but not near them. Well, you know, Chris, this time I was not, I was not on the coast of um, either the Atlantic or the Indian ocean. So, but I'm kicking myself because about 10 or 15 years ago, when I was traveling in Africa with my best friend, Nani, who was doing Peace Corps in Zambia, with her now husband Bob, we were we traveled throughout the southern continent together, and we and we did spend some time in Cape Town, and it was a lovely city. Ugh, I mm -hmm. was probably only there about a week, but I fell in love. And Nani and her husband Bob actually stayed on there longer for a couple months working and whatnot. Uh, but this is where I could have seen them on Boulder mm -hmm. Beach there, because it's one of the places that they nest, and they're kind of known to for the most part, be fine with public being around them as long as they don't mm -hmm. interact with them or mess with them too much. And I didn't know that at the time, so I didn't do that. Nor did I, obviously, I'm sure you can travel around and see them, but I didn't do that as well, Right. which was yeah. hindsight. You're that close. You're that close. So I'm yeah, they, they range South Africa, Namib Namibia, and they usually can go, they, you know, they, they, they can be found like 40 kilometers offshore you know, so a little less than 20 miles, but you know, they, they basically are in coastal habitats and this is pretty much where you only find them. Now they do find some juveniles that tend to go maybe up to Angola or even up to Congo or over to Mozambique on the Indian side. They will range a little bit farther North, but their nesting sites and where they generally are as adults is those two parts of Africa. So the, the, the Southern tip and then the South Western tip is where you will find them. Now, why care about African penguins? I mean, the story that we're going to talk about how they've just been devastated. It's their population has been decreased by 90% in the 20th century. 
So they, they estimated in 1910, there was about 1.4 million adult birds. And that was just in one population alone on an island. So, you know, it, it, it's like there was millions of them. And that got reduced in the 1950s by about 140,000 just on that island. And in the 1990s, the population was doing okay at 180,000. But today in 2019, so you're talking the last 20 something years. There's only about fifty thousand left breeding pairs, so well, yeah, make, not doing so hot. It, yeah, and to make it cut a little bit deeper, it's one thing when we talk about oh, you know, a hundred years ago, but in the last twenty eight years, Chris, their population has declined by sixty percent. Yeah, yeah, it's it's devastating. It's been devastating. It's been devastating. There's so many pressures, and it's. You know, these are, are predators, right? So they, fe- they feed mainly on fish and then they're prey to seals and sharks. Okay, so they're critical to this food web. They have a critical role and they are being devastated. Devastated human impacts. I mean, human impacts. Well, I think it's true to say that penguins are really excellent indicators of ocean health mm-hmm. in general. And so if that's what's been happening the last 100 years or 28 years, that's not a good sign. No. In general. No. no, it's starting to break down. I mean, the food web's starting to break down. And we know that. And we know that. But there's people out there fighting to protect it. So anyways, you know, there, there's a reason to care about this story and these African penguins. Well, and they're just cute. <laughs> there's that. <laughs> and they're a very char- well, they're a very charismatic species with tourists. And a lot of tourists would it's probably more convenient for a lot of tourists to go to South Africa or South America and to perhaps see a penguin than it is to trek all the way down to the Antarctic. Right. Right. So for ecotourism and things like that, there's definitely a benefit to keeping them around. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now the African penguin scientific name is Sphenicus demersis. So excellent. There you go. The genus is Sphenicus. And this is the group known as banded penguins. And they're the part of group that has the Galapagos penguin, which is the one found the farthest north, which we covered Galapagos a few weeks ago and the marine iguana. So one of the places I think Angie and John are supposed to go to next year. Is it 2021? That was your the year you got married, right? Yeah. Well, tw- oh, the 10-year anniversary. Spot. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was. <laughs> um, geez, I didn't know we were going to be doing a quiz show tonight, Chris. I yeah, 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 my yeah, slides. Yeah. I know it was. Uh, it was. Tw- it was 2012. Okay, 2012. So, so I, I did tell John 20- that he's taking you to the Galapagos on your 10 year anniversary. So there or Africa with the kids, but okay. Yeah, nah. either one. Nah, I mean Galapagos. they would like Galapagos nah. too, but I feel like. There's more wildlife in Africa. I just so many decisions. I have to get a job first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. So, so that's South America West, right? And then you go mm-hmm. a little bit farther down. You have the Humboldt penguin, which is Chile and Peru. Then you have the Magellan penguin off South America, and that's more east. Now, penguins, you know, again, there's 17 to 20 species, and you know, this they're all part of the the subfamily Sphenicinae. And, you know, again, the Disney movie, Adelie Penguin, the Rockhopper Penguin, Emperor Penguin, the little blue-eyed penguin in Australia. So there's so many beloved species, but this African penguin is the one that that's in deep, deep trouble. Now, during the Emperor Penguin episode, I really went in depth on penguin evolution because we do understand it. It's just, a, again, another great species that to, to study that over time has changed you know, it came from a group of birds that lived about 70 million years ago. It's just, they're amazing. The very first penguin species, it lived in this this continent or whatever it was called was Gond- Gondwana. And it was just a large landmass with Australia, New Zealand, Antarctica, and parts of South America. So that's kind of where they, they first evolved. Now, their closest relatives are petrels and albatross, which we're going to do an albatross, I promise you, soon. Uh, The loons, frigate birds. So they kind of all emerged from that group way back when, 70 Mm -hmm. million years ago. Now, what I thought was really cool was from the fossil evidence, penguins first developed on the South Island of New Zealand. 
So that is really cool. And the, the is, oldest, yeah, I know. And the oldest known penguins about 60 million years ago. And the Waimanu Manaringi. So that's kind of where the modern penguins came from. It lost its ability to fly and had shorter wings. So it was good for diving. And why they did this, it's just they, they adapted to a marine environment. They didn't need to fly. They started really diving into the, the ocean and getting fish and other things. I know, that, Chris. Would you rather would you rather be able to fly or be like a marine a fly. bird or no question fly. <laughs> I'd rather fly. Yeah, I think me too. I think so too. But I guess it probably was crowded. Like the airspace was getting crowded and they're like, we're just yeah. gonna go into the water. Well, and it's but I do know, per, I I do prefer seafood over to insects, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, really, I guess I'd a really good grasshopper that. every now and then's good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, crickets is where it's at. That's like the protein we all need to live on. I and know. Make the planet greener. No, I mean, I could fly to Europe tomorrow, and I'd be very happy. You know, I could do all sorts of fun things if I could fly. Swim would take a while. <laughs> Plus, you know, it's like <laughs> I don't want to get preyed upon. No, I don't. It, it, it's. It, when I was looking at this again, it made me think when you always talk form and function and how these little alterations, you know, we talk about the giraffe, how the giraffe's necks have just gotten longer and longer and longer to get to the canopies as the trees get taller and taller and taller. You know, the giraffes just kept evolving with them because the ones that could reach it survived, the ones that couldn't, didn't. So Natural selection, absolutely. Yeah. And so penguins, they 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 lost their ability to fly because they didn't need their wings. The ones that learned to swim with those pseudo wings survived, fed, and they passed on their genetics. And the wings just got shorter. And now you have like these flippers, which are actually their wings. So that's why they, over time, they turned into what we see today. And then their feather coats became water resistant or proofed and stuff like that. So just amazing. I mean, just they're so much fun. They're they're just so Ooh, is much it fun. Fun facts time right now. <laughs> almost, almost. Okay. So, because I've got some. <laughs> all right. So about fifty million years ago is when penguins were pretty much adapted to the water. Once dinosaurs died out, then the penguins kind of really diversified and took off. So penguin one is the very first one. You know that again fifty million years ago and gave rise to the emperor penguin, which leads me to my fun fact, and then we'll get into your fun facts, because I did say this in emperor penguin, I don't know if people remember, but can you remember how big the largest penguin ever was? <laughs> how tall? I'm a really visual person with my memory, and, and uh, so no, I don't remember specifically, but I feel like when you told me the answer, I pictured John in a penguin suit, and he's like six yes. foot tall. Almost 5'11". Right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> he might be 5'11 and a half. Wink, wink. Don't tell anybody. But yes. <laughs> they, they, the largest penguin ever lived, died out about 30 million years ago, the late Eocene, was 5'11, weighed 200 pounds. Okay. He does not weigh that much. <laughs> Could you imagine? Although this is pre-holiday season. Oh, so. uh, looking eye to eye to penguin that is, with that That's beak. huge no, though. I mean, you. I'm making jokes right uh, now. They but found yes, fossils is... off Antarctica. Yeah. yeah, right. Huge, huge. Yeah. And like I said, the emperor penguins That's a little so... less than four feet tall. I mean, they're pretty tall, but yeah, it's pretty amazing. You know what it's Disney needs to make? I'm just going to – like, remember that movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? And I'm showing my age because yeah. most of you I don't remember that movie. <laughs> but they shrink down to be like insects and they're like walking in the grass and like mm -hmm. a mushroom mm -hmm. is huge. I think Disney should do the flip side of that, but with like giant mammals. And so you get to like yeah. walk through – uh, whatever biome, you know, they should have it set up by different biomes and, and it should be correct. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it should be like, correct. Like the correct sizes of these animals and maybe they can move a little bit with like robotics Ugh. or something. Yeah. So you can just get an idea of like the giant sloth and the giant yeah. armadillo and some of those guys, the giant incredible. rodent. That's the size of a cow. Like it's bigger than yeah. a bull. Like, I was yeah. just, we went to um, <laughs> silver spring state park and they have just have a little, uh, just like a little kind of history area where they have some different fossils. And so they had a claw from a, from a ground sloth and Chris, this claw, just like the, the nail uh -huh. part was Eight or nine inches long, maybe, maybe, maybe even twelve inches. Yeah, just yeah. like one nail claw. Yeah, yeah. And they obviously yeah. had like four or five of them. <laughs> right. 
I know, I know. It's like the uh, if you go back in time a few million years ago, I think you would die of fright. The animals were huge. That's they what I'm huge. saying. That could be like the next like whatever horror nights at you know Universal Studio or something. Yeah, there you go. What the Earth Although used all to look us, like. All of us like animal and uh, you know evolution dorks. dorks definitely, yeah. you fall in that category. Yeah, it wouldn't. Yep. It would, I don't know if it'd be frightening. It'd just be like fascinating right it would be it would be i would love to see that because i uh, i wouldn't want to live then i would not want to live then now some things we know about african penguins they can live up to 20 years when they're hunting for prey they can swim up to 12 miles per hour or 20 kilometers per hour and i'll just remind you the fastest human on earth can swim at a sprint five miles per hour so they can definitely outswim us quickly quickly oh for sure yeah, and then definitely, definitely, this lady. I was not a sprinter. No, I was a distance. I had a yeah. lot of heart, not a lot of not a, not a lot of talent. <laughs> I'm probably like one mile per hour swimming. So, um, no, and they, the again, just some of the physiology before we get into some more of the, the facts about them. They do molt like most birds, and it takes about 20 mm-hmm. days, and it's. You know, they, they shed their feathers. The birds do this. It's a normal process. I forgot what episode we talked about the molting, but you know, the, these feathers do get worn or old. And so about once a year, but it takes a lot out of them and they lose about half their body weight. And so they have to go out to sea and spend about six weeks fattening up again after the molt. Like, yeah. So it's ca- yeah, the, catastrophic. It's, yeah. Right? That's called yeah. the pre, pre molting phase. They go and, and fatten themselves up. And they get the reserves they needed. And I read in one place that they'll gain up to 31% of their normal body weight Mm -hmm. in this Mm -hmm. pre-molting, fattening up phase, which is a lot, uh, especially for a little bird like that. But the reason they do this is because during the molting phase, they're unable to forage because their feathers that are growing in are not yet waterproof. Mm -hmm. And so there's estimates out there that during this time, they won't feed for about 18 days. Wow. Oof. Ugh. Yeah. That's going to be miserable. Uh, and then, of course, and then after molting, they have these new sleek feathers that are waterproof and insulated. And then they head back out to sea and will spend about six weeks replacing the fat reserves that they lost. And it's estimated that they'll lose about 41% of their body weight wow. during that molting phase. And this is usually before the breeding season. So they need to gain it back. So it's a lot of, a lot of, gains and losses. And well, Chris, it's really interesting for me from a little, so one, of this, one of the labs I've been uh, helping out and working, it's, it's pretty molecular. And so we mm-hmm. talk a lot about genes and uh, RNA and, and then applying some of my behavior background, like what, what is triggering that? Like, how do they, mm-hmm. from a behavior, how do they know? Right. Okay. Right. Now I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to molt and yeah. You know, and in six weeks. So I need to go we'll out. Go I mean, there has go to be eat. some kind of seasonal cue or the constellations or a photo period, mm-hmm. maybe, right? We talk about photo mm-hmm. period a lot in horses. I mean, the answer is I don't think scientists know uh, what uh, triggers that behavior, right? That, that, that motivation to all of a sudden go from like normal, how they normally like would hunt and catch fish, which we'll talk a little bit more when we get to behavior because they do some really cool, cool stuff. Uh, but to, to doing it triple fold, double fold to fatten right. up. It's just now it makes sense to me after not eating for 18 days during the molting phase. That makes sense to me. Yeah. They'd be very driven and motivated to get back in the water and eat. Right. But why like go? Yeah. Crazy fast. How to anticipate. But yeah. There's just, there's just so much out there when we talk about like genetics and behavior and what drives and motivates animals and, we throw this term around like, oh, they're animal instincts and things like that. But, but truth be told, I there's still a lot that we don't know about what motivates an animal to do these really cool behaviors from a and which are super necessary for them to to be able to ensure that their feathers stay waterproof and mm-hmm. insulated and you know I'm, just like the hairs on your head, they, they get old after a while, right? Like they need. They need to be replaced. Ours grow out con- continuously, right? That's why right, 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 right. Our our hair stays so beautiful and wonderful, theoretically. But there's, you know, feathers don't grow continuously. They grow to a certain size and then they stop. Mm-hmm. 
So anyways, yeah, I don't think I answered any questions. I no. just, I really dorked out on that earlier today. It's, 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 <laughs> it's okay, but it, it, it's, it's a very inner to get to, to bring it full circle, to get back to what you were saying. How do they know? What is the trigger? You know, there's got to be something that says, okay, I'm going to be molting soon. I better go and eat or I'm going to die, you know, during that starvation period. And even the very first time they molt, right? Like what behavior, learn behavior, is it what triggers it? Is it a hormonal thing? Is it a learned behavior? That's, that's, I think there's another, I mean, we come up with so many projects for grad students. That's a, that's a really cool one. Yeah. That's a really cool one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just really, the genetics of behavior mm -hmm. uh, and what motivation are just right. really, uh, they're kind of, that's kind of what I'm really interested in this year in 2019. So yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. going to 2020. Yeah. But molting, a lot of birds do that. So it's cool. And it's something to talk and think about over a campfire for sure, for sure, for sure. And I need to read, <laughs> and I need to read more up on it. And there's probably a bird biologist or physiologist out there that could, that could really educate us on all these fun bird facts, but something that definitely sets the African penguin apart from other birds and even other penguins is these pink areas above the mm -hmm. eye or pink eyelids that they have when you look at their and we'll put a couple of pictures up in our show notes or even if you just google them but they have these these really cool like pink areas above their eyes of pink skin that are basically kind of embedded in their black face mask are really important for thermal regulation mm -hmm. we mentioned the fact that they obviously aren't in the antarctic right so they're not in cold snowy climates they're in more hot climates for the most part. Or when they're on land, they're, it's super hot. And then when they're in the water, it's pretty cold, especially diving mm -hmm. deep, uh, which they can, they typically dive about a hundred feet, but it can be up to 400 feet, right? So mm -hmm. the water's chilly. Mm -hmm. Their feathers, especially newly molted feathers, help insulate them. But when we get into behavior and nest building, we're going to talk a lot about the heat that is in the area of South Africa is a problem. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's been to Africa, there's actually a term that's called Africa hot. Mm -hmm. And I have been Africa hot before and it's no joke. And so this pink above their eye helps them actually cope with changing temperature. When the temperature gets hotter, the body of the African penguin sends more blood to these glands above their eyes to be cooled off by the air surrounding it. Mm -hmm. This then causes the gland to turn a darker shade of pink. So, and I should make sure that, you, that it's not covered by any feathers. It's like open skin. Right, 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 so right. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the reasons it helps them cool off or thermoregulate when they're hot and not in the water. So, obviously, Antarctic penguins, like the emperor, which we've done, don't need to have that because no, no. <laughs> they don't have to worry about being too hot, right? They have other issues going on. Yeah, I was reading about that because I thought I saw the pink and I was like, oh, that's kind of unique. And then, you know, you think about how a bird can thermoregulate. I know Stephanie talked about them panting a lot in the heat. So that's one way, you know, they, they circulate the blood up there. It cools off and circulates, you know, why the heart's pumping and circulates back in to help cool down the body. So, yeah, that's a cool adaptation. Yeah. And another one is that they have built-in swim goggles in their eyes. Oh, okay. And this is the first I'd read about this. I'm sure all of our bird fans out there are like, come on, Angie. But the technical term is called the uh, nicotating. I probably said that wrong. Nicotating membrane or third eyelid. Mm -hmm. And it's a clear protective barrier that is held shut when swimming. And it acts as basically swim goggles. Um to allow them to be able to see underwater, but also protect their eye and not only see their prey, but also see what's preying upon them, such as sharks, whales, mm -hmm. and other types of seals. So it, this third eyelid or the nicotating membrane, it's translucent and it also helps keep their eye lubricated. Um, and they, yeah, they have yeah. their own membrane. 
Earth. I know. It's pretty cool that mammals can, can go and dive and see underwater, you know? So it, it, it is cool. It's you mean really birds. cool. Well, birds and, and men, mammals, like seals and stuff. So, yeah, you know, that, yeah. that have that, that membrane. That's really cool. Yeah. So using those goggles, Angie, is how they can find these fish that they feed on, the, the pelagic schooling fish, per, particularly sardines and anchovies. And like you said, they can dive pretty deep, hold their breath for two minutes. They eat about a pound of food a day, which is enormous but 14% of its body weight per day. Cause I mean, as a human, we, I think I remember go back, it's like five pounds per day. So these little things are eating about a pound per day, which is a lot. And again, they travel uh, to find food somewhere around 30 to 70 kilometers, depending. Now this is where obviously during the breeding season, they don't forge out as, as much because like, you know, one will go out and forage and then come back. And then the other one, they'll switch off parenting duties. But this is where these, another pressure that these animals, particularly the African penguins are, are having with climate change and overfishing. So I think Angie's mm-hmm. going to talk about the nests that have been destroyed, which is a huge problem, but you couple that with the climate change and the changing of, I'm going to talk about it here in the currents around there and the overfishing that's going on in the oceans. There are no fish there. There, these, these penguins are having a hard time foraging and surviving in this environment right now. And that's why we're seeing the numbers decrease as bad as we can. And the numbers are decreasing. So talking about food webs, right? I mean, you're talking about a warming planet. So you're changing the habitat of the oceans for all the species in it. Fish are changing where they migrate and go because fish are chasing their food. Because when you talk, you know, you go down and look at the krill and the plankton and and where they are, that's where the fish are going to go. The smaller fish and the bigger fish follow those fish. So they're foraging out in different areas of the ocean now. And it's been thousands and thousands, if not millions of years that these animals have cohabitated in this environment and you're getting this rapid change. This isn't slow. This is rapid. And that is why scientists are are scared and alarmed because the oceans are getting warmer. The salinity is changing. The pH is changing. There's low oxygen. So fish survival is changing. Their, their range is changing. I mean, just all of this, right? So you throw all of this to a penguin that depends on South Africa as its home they have nowhere else to go. They're struggling. They're they're in a big struggle. And Angie, I found a really interesting uh, UN report. Now it's a little dated, t- 2011, so it's probably only gotten worse. But <laughs> anyways, this is this was interesting because this was from the Food and Agriculture from the UN, and the mm. title is "Climate Change Implications for Fisheries of the Bengula Current Range." Okay, so the Bengula Current is the one that's off South Africa. Okay. Okay. So that's where these fish are, these pelagic fish. And so they looked at this and, and they're looking at the human impact more, but you can imagine the wildlife impact. So this is where I get on my soapbox, Angie. So zooplankton, the abundance, they measured it in the last 70 years, has gone way down. There's a big decline in the last 10 to 20 years of zooplankton in this current so you're seeing a reduction in larger fish, which means smaller fish are also not there, and you're having this huge environmental impact. The one thing they point to, and again, they're looking at fisheries, right? They're looking at because the peoples of Africa that are fishing off their coast for food are suffering because there's no fish. I mean, they're just they're they're disappearing. So you just translate that to this poor little penguin. And it's got nowhere to go and, and nowhere to eat. So they definitely, climate change is a big one. So they said like there's this cold upwelling in the current that's been persistent. And then they have the South Atlantic high pressure system, which are main causes for the arid part of the Southwestern coat of Africa. So they're seeing a lot more droughts. I know, gosh, we talked about it in the elephant episode two weeks ago. South Africa suffering, you know, Botswana, uh, Zambia, I think Mozambique, you know, elephants are dropping dead because of the droughts. It's, they're suffering this. And that's what's, what's going on with climate change. And that's why scientists were like, ah, oh, we shouldn't have called it global warming because it's just erratic. The climate is just erratic. It's not predictable. 
you know, where a rainforest always depends on the rain and it's evolved for thousands and millions of years. Oh, hey, it always rains here. So all these plants grow, all these animals live there. Well, now all of a sudden there's no rain. And it's like, uh oh, you know, how do we survive? How do these plants survive? How do these animals survive? And the, since the mid 1990s in this current, their fish catches have declined at least by 10% and they're missing millions of metric tons of fish. So you're talking about low level marine predators all the way up, ocean pollution, habitat degradation, fishing gear left in there. All of these things have had huge effects on the marine ecosystem. Well, and then Chris, too, a point to tie into that is commercial fisheries in general, sardine and anchovies, which is a big prey item of African penguins. Those commercial fisheries have also forced the penguins to go out farther Mm -hmm. from shore and to switch to less nutritious prey. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, yeah, there's, yes, as you mentioned, there's less fish in general, but then if we're commercially fishing even more of them. Right. So you're talking, this is what. Um, even less prey. Yeah. Yeah. Building the story on why these penguins are in so much trouble because they're, they're stuck, you know, on, on this part of the planet is where they're stuck. They have nowhere to go. They can't migrate to South America. They can't migrate to, you know, anywhere else on earth. This is their home and this is all they know. And so when they go out and look to eat and they can't find it and they can't find it and they're expending energy. Cause again, the wild is her. so oh. much energy. Oh, it's a Anybody hard place who's to ever live. swam yeah. knows how you feel yeah. after a day of being at the beach <laughs> or a pool swimming. Right. And that's being in the water for like, what, a half an hour, an hour, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Imagine mm-hmm. being out there endlessly looking for food and not being able to find it. And just to get food, just to, to pay off the energy deficit that you just expended in swimming. Right. You know, when you go out and you're right. burning all those calories, you need to eat to replace those calories or you start burning your, your fuel reserves. You get into your oh, fuel yeah. reserves. Oh, yeah. When I was on yeah. the swim team, I could yeah. eat anything and everything. And yeah. it was amazing. Watch out, yeah. Pizza Hut buffet. <laughs> So I think they raised the price when I was in high school. Right. Because of me and my friend Nani. <laughs> I mean, so it's it's all this Anthropocene, all this effect on the world. So when people say, oh, humans don't affect it, oh, baloney. We do. I mean, 90% of the large fish have been removed from the oceans. Three quarters of fish stocks are fished at their maximum yield lo- level. They're overfished, they're depleted. And it's all affecting wildlife and especially this little African penguin. Now, what I did say earlier in the podcast, the human impact, because that's what this report was really looking at. They weren't really looking at it from an African penguin impact. It was the human. So they should, but yeah, yeah, it all comes back to us. So it's like, you know, when you talk to people about why should I care about animals, this is why you should care because we're part of this food web. You know, we are part of this ecosystem. And if we destroy it, we don't have anything. We're not going to have anything to eat. We're not, it's all going to be desert and it's all going to be, there's going to be nothing in the oceans. You know, we can't even, you know, you'd say, oh, we'll replace it with, with our food. We'll grow more crops. Well, no, we talked about elephants two weeks ago. You remove elephants from the ecosystem. The desertification of, uh, was it the desertification of Zimbabwe sped up, you know, where you're losing crops, you're losing topsoil. These animals all play a critical role. So anyways, really quickly, fishing, huge impact on Africa for the people there. It's going to affect the government because you're not making money. Your people are hungry. Recreational fishing goes down. Small scale fisheries are in trouble. The, the global, it's going to affect global markets because a lot of these fish are, are exported. The infrastructure on coastal development, you know, people are going to migrate because there's no jobs, because there's no fish and there's no food. So you're going to have this mass migration. It's affecting fresh water in Angola. Uh, because water's warming up and you're you're having influence there. Low oxygen levels, you know, you're going to see sea level rise, which we know. There's already islands in the Pacific that are underwater. People are being displaced. Sea sur- surface temperatures increasing, which changes wind speed, affects weather patterns, and it's all going to affect health, overall human health. I mean, there's all of these impacts. And this is just looking at this current off Africa. You know, let's imagine. Let's, I know the uh, the Antarctic current we talked about in Emperor Penguins. That one's changing. So it's all again why 
me and Angie are so passionate because we look at the data, we read these reports, we get this global perspective, and that's why we're trying to really get you excited to to get out there and spread the message because we need to do this together. Together. Amen. Yes. All right. I'm done. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> no, I like no, I like your soapbox. And it is, it's yeah. really it's critical to hear that and be reminded of that. And if you're not a numbers person or that even seems like it's too heavy, I can take it down a notch with some of their fun behavior because yeah. they are <laughs> amazing, amazing, right? You just you just yeah. look at them and you and you want and you want to save them and and but I think that's the thing too is we have to get beyond like oh they're they're cute and uh they they have a really critical role and saving them we're going to save ourselves. Mm-hmm, and there's mm-hmm. that whole it's a really important kind of concept of yeah. you want to take care of the area where you eat. Yes. Uh yes. Because it's going to come back to you, right? Mm-hmm, like all mm-hmm. the pollutants we're putting out in the ocean are now in the fish, and we eat the fish. Yeah, I know, I know. That's if there are, that's a, if there are even any fish. And so, right. I think that's why it's important for all of our animal enthusiasts out there. If you are studying uh, animal physiology, science, b- behavior, anything like that, or wildlife conservation, it is important too to maybe tack on some of these environmental and or conservation classes. I was scared when I had to take environmental geochemistry, but it's also what helped me made me a better overall scientist and understanding other biological geochemistry systems and cycles and things like Mm -hmm. that, Mm -hmm. because it's really important for where the animals live. So that's always what's motivated me as an animal lover in general, that's why I started down the zoology route. But since right. then, we and anybody who's listened to this podcast knows it's taken me and Chris down several other roads from, my goodness, I had to learn analytical chemistry mm-hmm. or, or whatever it is to to try to understand the systems that these animals live in. And no, I'm not, Chris and I are not uh, climatologists, but we know how to read the data. And, um, and it's important to be able to, I think, t- to at least, have an appreciation for it in general, or even just as an animal lover in itself, because it is important because what we want more of in this world and what we need more of this endangered African penguin needs to stick around because these cute little birds are endlessly entertaining, Mm -hmm. watching them walk around, waddle around, stand, preen their feathers, uh, make vocalizations, uh, interact socially with another, al groom each other. It's we we need more of that. Uh, African penguins are super clumsy on land. They kind of remind me of people that maybe drank too much or something. They're just not. Yeah. They're not very. <laughs> they're not very smooth when they hop right. from rock to rock. You're holding your breath because well they might fall down and they probably do, and they waddle out to the ocean. But my goodness gracious, when they get in that water, they are agile, gorgeous, stunning mm-hmm. swimmers. Mm-hmm. And I watched a lot of footage this past week of them swimming around and was just in marvel about how graceful they are. They look like they're flying in the water. Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. just beautiful. And as Chris mentioned, they can swim up to 15 miles per hour. They dive around 100 feet to up to 400 or so. And what was really cool too that I didn't mention when we were talking about feathers and molting is that African penguins have some of the most or some or maybe the most feathers per square inch of any other bird. In wow, fact, it's okay. 300%, yeah, 300% more feathers than flighted birds. Huh. But these feathers are critical to help keep them warm when they're far offshore and mm-hmm. diving and also helps uh, propel them through the water. And so African penguins are going to spend most of their lives at sea, except for when it's time for them to come and breed and lay their eggs and raise their youngs. And when that does happen, they're very social. Uh, there's a lot of allopreening. So preening is a fancy word for grooming in birds. In horses or in primates, we usually just call it grooming. But in birds, it's called preening. So there's a lot of allopreening that happens. And it's due to the fact that they are social when they're in these colonies on land. But a lot of it's also, too, because it's hard for them to preen their own heads and necks, right? Their their beak or bill can only reach so many different areas. And the allopreening helps them clean and rearrange their feathers and, of course, will remove parasites and such as ticks. 
And when African penguins are hanging out in their colonies during breeding time, they're going to be the most busy during dusk and dawn. And that's probably due to the heat of the day. Uh, And breeding pairs are going to build nests or burrows or some type of shelter that primarily provides protection from the sun. So totally different than our emperor penguins in the Antarctic. And when the African penguins are hanging out on shore, it's really important that they communicate with each other. And we opened up with a vocalization, which is what they're famous for, one of their braying sounds, which other species make this braying sound as well. But the uh, African penguin is notorious for it because it's just so perhaps loud and undesirable, depending. For me, I love it, but I guess if if it's if they're in your neighborhood and they're making that sound throughout the night, which in one of the BBC nature documents I was watching that the neighbors were uh, complaining about the loud vocalizations of the African penguins, I suppose it could be, you know, not desirable, yeah. but they communicate obviously through vocalizations um, and they have the brays, which is used to attract the mate during mating season. They have yells that are used to defend their territory. They have a haw. Um, which is also helps them locate a mate um, when one is uh, when one is at land and the other one's in sea. If they're feeling threatened, they can have an aggressive displays where they'll puff out their chest and hold their wings back and their beak forward. They can also bob their head from side to side as a way to tell somebody that they're not pleased with them. And then, of course. Their vocalizations are really, really, really critical to help them distinguish from one another. And researchers have been studying basically how they can recognize each other through these distinct calls. Because if you think about it, Chris, it's it's super loud on those mm-hmm. breeding colonies, right? Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. all hee-haw and braying, you name it. It's breeding season. It's hot and heavy. They're making these noises. So when they come to shore, how do they find? I know. It's crazy. And we'll talk about it in breeding a little bit, but about 80 to 90% of African penguins are thought to be monogamous and they breed with each other, the same mate year after year. So how do they find each other? And a lot of it is through these distinct vocalizations and these patterns. And they call this phenomenon of being in a noisy, crowded, chaotic situation, the cocktail party effect. It's like being at a cocktail party, but you hear your best friend's voice and you're like, oh, there's Charlie telling that story over there. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've never heard that. That is so true, though. You can. Mm -hmm. You can isolate a voice that you recognize and be like, oh. There she is. Wow. There's my I never, mom. For there sure. you go. I, There's an aha laugh. moment. Yeah. 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 Like, or oh, a that's laugh. Cool. Like we all, okay. Like, yeah. Okay. I have some friends with, uh, with some very distinct laughs that I could pick out of a lineup. And, yeah. but, but it is really interesting. And so researchers are trying to figure out if it's based on like rhythm and like short syllables versus long syllables. There's something called inhalation syllables. So the the rhythmic structure seems to be unique to different individuals. So they're trying to test that and figure if it's more rhythm oriented, syllable oriented. So just cool stuff um, because it is when we talk about intelligence, it's really sets them apart from a lot of other birds. And we think of intelligent birds. We think of the raven. We think of the Mm -hmm. crow. Mm -hmm. uh, And Typically, a penguin's probably not going to come up, but several researchers and people that work with penguins are arguing, well, that's, we're probably been overlooking them or just not knowing how to study them. Because if you just think about how they're able to find each other Mm -hmm. year after Mm -hmm. year, let alone navigating all the open water stuff that they have to do, uh, is just, you know, I mean, that's pretty incredible. And a study came out in 2017 that was published in, like, I think the Royal Proceedings. 
that just once again, Chris blew my mind because, you know, 2019 for me has been, even though I'm a hoof and horn girl, 2019 Mm -hmm. has been a lot about carnivore behavior and carnivore social hunting. I still want that book for Christmas. I know. Anybody who's listening. (laughs) John. (laughs) John. Uh, But this study showed that in African penguins who you know, hunt for these fish by diving, these deep diving uh, tactics, group foraging, when they foraged in group, increased their overall efficiency of catches Hmm. in the African penguin. So catch per unit, I'll just read you a quick quote from abstract. Catch per unit effort was significantly improved when targeting fish schools as opposed to single fish. That kind of makes sense. But especially when they are foraging in groups. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So if they were in groups yeah. and targeting fish, schools of fish together, they were more successful. And so once again, when we think about intelligence or social behavior, coordinated hunting, I mean, it still blows my mind how like wolves and wild dogs do it when they're in land. How do you do coordinated hunting when I you're know, in water? I know. I mean, what? how are you signaling to each other? Like you yeah, go left, yeah, you go up, yeah, you go down. Yeah. I mean- and of course, researchers don't know this, but we what they do know is that there's rapid information processing mm-hmm. happening mm-hmm. that's helping them not only predict where the fish are moving and what move they should take, but also working in tangent with another African penguin or a group of yeah. them to hunt. So just really, really cool stuff. Uh, and it's also been reported that penguins have really good memories as well. And when speaking about memories, king penguin chicks at 10 months old can find their way back to a square meter space in a huge colony when they wander a quarter to a third of a mile away. So they're using either visual cues or some kind of, you know, they they know where they're going and how to get there. um, And they're able to find each other and communicate with each other very effectively, not only on land, but clearly in the open sea as well. And so I think, I think they're one of the more underestimated birds as far as everybody just thinks they're kind of like tuxedos yeah, 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 around yeah, yeah. and yeah. waddling and they're, they're so I clumsy know, know. of course, and, and loud uh, um, on land. But I think there's a lot, you know, research is showing there's a lot more to them than what. Right, the right, eye. right, right. No, I mean, they, you know, it's, that's why we, we need, you know, you and I were committed to, to covering more birds in this podcast. You know, we, we love our mammals, you know, large megafauna, but birds just amaze us at every turn. At every turn, every bird podcast, I think you and I are just like, are you kidding me? Like we learned something. I mean, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. I just, I mean, once again, these, well, and not only learning something, I think Especially maybe as we move into like Valentine's Day into the new year and stuff like that. We got to start their courtship. Oh, I know. I know. I know. Oh, incredible. we're birds of paradise coming. Yeah. And birds so, of paradise. They're coming. Yeah. And so, and the other thing, I mean, it's just so cool. And African penguins, like I said, most are monogamous and they've been known to stick with their partner for 10 years. So a lot longer than people yeah. in the United States, than 50% of the people yeah, in the United true. States <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> So, yeah, and they return to the same colonies, and they find their mate, and they hang out with their mate, and they're amazing partners, and I'll get to that in a second. And so their uh, nesting season is going to usually peak from March to May in South Africa and November and December in Namibia, depending on where they're located. And they build a nest, typically made out of guano, Historically, I should say. And guano is just a fancy name for those who aren't familiar uh, for feces. But living on shore and then the kind of sandy, rocky shores of the beach, this is a perfect nest that they can build and then burrow into it to get out of the heat of the, of the sun of Africa. And then also once their eggs are there to help protect their eggs from predators and, of course, from overheating in the sun as well. But as Stephanie will exp- articulate more in detail in her um, in our interview when we talk with her, but humans mm-hmm. love guano because it's an excellent fertilizer. Right. Yeah. 
And so humans have come in in the past, I don't know, 50, 60 yeah, years or so, and removed a lot of the guano that was these historic kind of nesting sites and areas for these African penguins, leaving them without a nest, a place to nest. And so they had to start over again. And of course, some didn't make it. But as Stephanie will explain, people are are beginning to recognize the error of their ways and try and help the African penguins out. So a lot of them are using alternate nesting material, um, such as vegetation and seaweed and rocks and shells and bones and feathers and other things that they can find to basically kind of make this nest to help protect itself and or its eggs and chicks from the heat and predators. But also uh, people such as Stephanie and her lovely group are going in and creating artificial mm -hmm. nests, which have been proven to be extremely yes. successful. So she'll talk more on that. But the nest is a huge part of a penguin's success when it's in these breeding colonies on the rocky shores of the islands. And historically, the monogamous pair would return to the same nest and nesting site each year. But when they come together, and it is breeding season, they have a very darling courtship ritual. And I'll, I'll add the link on our show notes from BBC Earth, but it basically involves noisy foreplay and fancy footwork, <laughs> to sum it up in yeah. a sentence. And so it's very cute. They do a lot of bill rubbing, clapping, slapping back and forth, like really fast. Uh, it's kind of looks like a fast, like handshake. It's pretty hilarious. And at the same time, they're kind of tapping their feet up and down and moving in a circle. And after that, they'll do a lot of L grooming, groom each other with a lot of honking and braying to help find each other and also show off their love for one another. And to the female, that honking braying sound of a donkey which once again is annoying to probably a lot of people in the vicinity, but or where it gets his, one of its nicknames, the jackass penguin. Uh, it's quite alluring to a female. <laughs> African penguin. I would try that in a bar, guys. I would not try it in a bar. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, a little hee haw gets him going. So it's pretty right. charming, but uh, yes. And so we'll put that video up because it's just, it's just, there's nothing cuter. It's just the cutest little yeah. courtship dance display ever. Uh, but anyways, once um, once they breed, eggs are going to be incubated in this burrow mm -hmm. or nest that's typically dug into the guano layer or now into an artificial nest. Or like I said, they've gotten clever and you are trying to use other things such as leaves and twigs and things like that. And so inside the nest... Uh, the female will lay a clutch of typically about two eggs that uh, both parents will incubate for about 40 days. They take turns. So the male will incubate. So we got a good, good daddy going on. He'll incubate the eggs while the female goes out and hunts. And then they'll switch spots and the male will go out and the female will incubate. And so that happens for about 40 days. And one parent is guarding the eggs at all time until the chicks hatch. And... When the chicks hatch, a parents will still continue to safeguard and feed the chick um, for at least 30 days. After the, And both parents take duties taking care of it and to protect it from predators and things and to feed it and things like that. Uh, and after about 30 days, the parents will leave the chick, go back out to sea. And what will happen is there's forms of basically like, I think of it as like teenage chicks, mm -hmm, if you mm -hmm. will, are juveniles. Uh, they're called creches. They'll form of anywhere from like up to 50 or 60 chicks and they hang out together. And so the parents will be really protective always with the chick, one of them, feeding them, taking care of them for the first 30 days. After that, they'll start to leave the chicks unattended while they go out and hunt. And these kind of unattended left at home, teenagers, if you will, will form crushes of about 55 chicks where they all hang out. But they're still not totally independent until about up to three months after hatching, where the parents will still come and help offer them some food in the interim. 
And African penguin chicks will fledge anywhere from 60 to 130 days. And a lot of that depends on the quality and the environment of the food that's around. And so, as Chris mentioned, with global climate change and things happening in the ocean, things like this can get delayed. Um, but the fledged chicks will eventually go to sea on their own, and they'll spend about one or two years out there just hunting. And then they'll return to their natal colony, so the colony where they were born, to molt and start their adult feathers or their adult plumage. They're not going to be ready to breed until they're about four to six years old. Uh-huh. So it's a pretty Long time. decent yeah. uh, generation interval as far as um, being able to, to reproduce again. And there's a lot of predators and hardships to even get that far. So it's really just a challenge to be mm-hmm. an African penguin. And I didn't mention it earlier, but and I didn't mention it early, Chris, but when the female lays, lays the eggs, if the nest is not the proper type of nest and the eggs get too hot because of mm-hmm. the sun, they get mm-hmm. overheated, she'll just abandon yeah. them because she knows they're not going to survive and she can't you know, risk her own mm-hmm. life. And so a lot of eggs are lost that way because these the guano that African penguins have a, evolved to dig down and you know, place their eggs in and protect themselves and their eggs, a lot of it's been removed yeah. and yeah. by man for fertilizer, for economic gains, uh, and just without really thinking about the long term repercussions of what this is gonna what this is gonna do to the African penguins and it's just been devastating. Yeah, I mean it's yeah. Like we said, they, they were millions of birds a hundred years ago and now 50,000 breeding pair and decreasing. So they're in, in trouble. And like we, yeah, the IUCN lists them as in yeah, danger. They're in danger. Yes. Yes. And it's just, again, they've been exploited. Now you have all these other pressures because the, the guano nests are pretty much gone, but you'll hear how Stephanie's talking about the artificial nests that they're building and, you add all this together and then their food is, is going away. These birds are in trouble, you know, they're in trouble. And that's why it's like, I think I, I opened up the podcast today talking about the story, why they're just, they highlight what's going on in the Anthropocene, how this one species, we highlight them, but you can extrapolate this to, again, I go always go to the Saiga, the tiger koalas are in deep, deep trouble now. It's, you know, all these species are being affected due to us and we can change it though. That's the thing. We can change it. And this week I get to talk about the organization because there's people out there fighting for these animals. And so this week we are going to highlight the Creative Animal Foundation because they are amazing. They are the ones that are working to help save the African penguins. This is, and I'm going to, you're going to hear more about it on Thursday, but this is Stephanie Arney and her husband, Tim Davison. This is what they have started. This is their foundation. Stephanie does a, an amazing job talking about the work she's doing in Africa for the African penguins. They have a documentary coming out. It's, I know it's been a little bit delayed, but you know, whenever you hear this, the you can go to savingpenguins.org and watch the documentary that they're putting out here pretty quick on the African penguin and the plight of the African penguin. It, it's inspirational. That's why you just you want to hear the interview with Stephanie. You want to hear the work that yeah, she Yeah, it's a feel good, it's a feel yeah, good video. It is, it is. And it's you It's why as humans we can learn what patterns were not working. We can break them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and change them. We can change our behavior because we have that cognition and that moral obligation to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's what her group is doing. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's again, you listen to this podcast. We always end it on a high note because there's people out there. There's organizations out there fighting for each species. It's a Pippos. 
That's the only one we've identified yet. I thought about that today. I'm like, gosh darn, John and I are going to have to do a hippo foundation. Like, I know. Nobody else is going to do it. It's so and even, even him, I told him that and he was like, I don't know. We can't do hippos. And I'm like, honey, I think we have to do hippos. It's the only one we've covered that doesn't have a foundation or something. Yeah, like that's that's our next big thing in life. So if you're out there, you can start a hippo foundation. We'll support you. So, but most oh my other gosh, species, some, yeah. yeah, most other species, there's somebody behind there. So go check out Stephanie and, and Tim. You're going to get more of it on Thursday, but it's creativeanimal.org. But really, savingpenguins.org, you can go there now. You can type that in. We'll put the, the links in our show notes. You can go there and see the work they're doing for the African penguins. So bravo to them. Just so inspirational. And just going to end it. Conservation tips. I, I, I've been remiss on doing this lately. Again, starting at the beginning, I'm just going to give you the, the, the one minute or less pitch. We all need to reduce our carbon footprint. I've been slipping. I know you're listening. You driving who's listening to this program or wherever you're listening, you know, you're like, dang it, I shouldn't have gotten that water bottle or dang it, I didn't do that today. We all mess up. It's being human, right? Uh, but let's do our best to reduce our carbon footprint. I'm going to put the carbon footprint calculator back on the show notes on this one. You can calculate to see what your carbon is, your footprint, personal footprint is and find ways to reduce it. And like last night, listening to Sandy from LA zoo talk, she's like plastic free July. When we did that, she's like, I went to the grocery store, this whole aisle. There's not one thing I could buy that wasn't wrapped in plastic. Like it's really yeah. hard to get away from, but if we just vote with our dollars, do the best we can, you know, we all do it. The thousands and thousands of people listening to this, if we all do it, we're going to make a difference and plant a tree while you're at it. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Vote with your dollar. It will change the world. May show big business that we're not going to buy products that are overwrapped in plastic yeah. or not sustainable or not even trying to be sustainable, mm -hmm. right? Like there's some things you just can't get away from. Yeah. yeah. You can't make everything perfect, but there's a lot of things that can. And yeah. they're, they're starting to take notice. We are on, there's a wave coming. Yes. There's a sustainable yes. wave coming. Yeah. And we're all a part of it. You guys are all a part of it. We're all conservation heroes. And it's just one step at a time. And sharing yep. the message, spreading the message, yep. and doing it for the animals. But then, of course, also doing it for yourself. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for listening. Share this episode. We love you. We will be back next week with a new species. And we're going to keep fighting this fight, all of us together. We, we're going to do it. We all are going to do it. I know it from the bottom of my heart. So thank you. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.